Hey y'all, Data Guy here, back with yet another viewer request video, this time on what are the top 10 best practices, best tips and tricks that you can use to optimize a self-managed Apache Spark cluster. Um, it's something we're seeing a lot in the industry these days. You know, people went to Databricks and Databricks got really expensive. So now a lot of people are going and trying to self-manage Apache Spark on their own. So they have more control over, you know, the performance, the cost, and also the ability to customize it however they might want to. Um, but it also comes with additional burdens and, you know, needing to set and optimize and tune and monitor and scale uh, all the things that, you know, Databricks did for you, um, you now have to do for yourself. So there are some trade-offs with, you know, moving away from a managed solution like that. So what I'm going to try to go through with you in this video are some of the top tips that you can use to help you operate Spark reliably on your own uh, so that you can keep running it efficiently as a managed service now that you're doing it yourself. So that's where we're gonna go through this video. If you like these videos, please like, subscribe, consider joining my Patreon for early access to videos um, and also early access to me. Um, but above all else, hope you enjoy this video. Let's get into it. So the first and probably the most impactful thing that you can do when you're trying to run Spark on your own is right size your cluster based on your workload patterns. Um, and that's kind of what I have an example here where it's not necessarily, hey, you know, just using less workers or trying to use existing workers more efficiently, but maybe it's using different shapes of workers or many smaller workers. Um, and just, you want to avoid over provisioning or under provisioning your Spark cluster where you have either excess compute that's not getting utilized when you run your jobs, or if your jobs start to run into out of memory issues as well. Um, and so really this is gonna depend on kind of whether you're doing batch or streaming workloads. Uh, batch workloads are generally gonna benefit from larger executors and more memory, while streaming workloads are gonna need sta stable, continuous, lower amounts of resources, but with really low latency to you know, make sure that they're accomplishing their streaming workloads in their given SLAs. Um, you can also use tools in Spark like dynamic allocation to allow Spark to actually adjust executor counts based on workload demand. So a bit of auto scaling, uh, which is really good for making sure you know, you're using efficient use, uh, you're using your resources efficiently, especially if you're really spiky workload demand, you know, at maybe at peak times. Um, and then you could also, at, the way you're going to tune this over time is, you know, use the historical job metrics to then tune your core memory and executor settings to set the amount of memory to the amount that's actually being used. Um, so you don't have, you know, a lot of excess memory, like in this example, where you might have a lot of really large workers, um, but there's actually a lot of excess memory in each worker versus many smaller workers can do those jobs more efficiently because it's a lot of small jobs. Um, so that's really the first thing you want to look at when you're setting up your Spark cluster. Now, the next thing you want to think about is choosing the right cl cluster manager. You have a few different options with Spark. You have Yarn, Kubernetes, Mesos, and just a Spark standalone cluster option. For cloud native setups, Kubernetes is probably going to be the best option because it has flexibility, auto scaling, and containerization built in at the core, so you don't have to you know reinvent the wheel there. Uh, Yarn is best if you're still working with Hadoop, and if you are, I pity you, but you know it is still around. Um, and then standard mode, standalone mode is very simple. It's mainly just you know, hey, I want to run a single Spark cluster. I'd say mainly for dev environments, you're going to want to go standalone. But for any really you know cloud uh, environment or any production environment, go with Kubernetes um, or potentially Mesos in some cases. Um, but mainly Kubernetes as your underlying cluster manager. But really, you know, if you're you know using a lot of Hadoop, make sure you're aligning your cluster manager with your broader infrastructure and the DevOps strategy within your organization because that's the most important thing at the end of the day. So the next thing I want to talk about is leveraging data partitioning smartly. Um, partitioning data is going to directly impact your performance, especially in large data sets and allow you to query that data faster. Um, so you're really going to want to think about partitioning your data on the most frequently queried columns because that's going to make the most difference when you know understanding, hey, uh, so the system knows Spark goes, I need to go access data from this partition and not go iterate over the entire data set. Um, you do want to avoid going too small and too small in your partitions because they're going to kill your parallelism. Um, you really want to think only about using parallelism on larger data sets because number one, that's going to have the most performance benefit um, and really using that smart, smaller, really small data sets is going to introduce more problems than it actually solves. Um, and you can also use built-in tools like repartition or coalesce strategically to control the shuffle um, of your partitions over time. So you're going to you know, probably need to manage your data and your partitions actively over the life cycle of your Spark cluster uh, because you know maybe one partition gets really filled up with data and so you need to think about partitioning again. Um, and so 
that's really one of the biggest things you can apply to your data. Um, and also there's a lot of tools built in to help make those queries of that data go a lot faster. Another thing you're going to want to consider when dealing with partitions is that you have some different Spark configurations you can use to actually help automate the partitioning your data and make it keep it efficient over time. Um, some key settings here are going to be the Spark shuffle partitions uh, setting, so you can lower it for smaller jobs, but increase it for larger shuffles to increase, you know, hey, how much partitioning is going, how much your partitions are going to re rebalanced, um, because if you have really large files that you know, are generating large amounts of data, you're going to need to reshuffle them relatively regularly to make sure that data stays evenly distributed. Um, also, the Spark memory fraction setting um, for fine-tuning caching versus execution memory, understanding, hey, what amount of memory do you actually want to keep in cache for quick reaccess versus you know, sending back to the database so it has a longer to get queried again. Um, it depends on, hey, how much your data is being frequently accessed, right? If it's only a small fraction, then you only need a small fraction here. Um, and then also the auto broadcast join threshold. So you basically just want to set this to the largest dimension table size um, so that you can broadcast joins based on the largest table size that you're actually working with. Um, and you can also use a Spark UI and event logs to keep reiterating these values over time to you know, align with what your actual data size is. Now, the next thing you're going to want to think about when using Spark is going to be optimizing joins and using broadcast wisely. Um, improper joins can overwhelm memory and result in disk spills. So use things like broad joins for your smaller tables. Um, those are basically broadcast joins, sends the smaller table to all the worker nodes and make sure each worker node has a smaller copy of that smaller table of memory. Um, so you're only going to want to use that for small tables because if you overwhelm every worker node with a really large table, it's going to slow down your performance. Um, and then also prefer bucketing and partitioning and joining based on those values um, to minimize the shuffle needed when rejoining tables. Um, and then also avoid Cartesian joins unless explicitly required. Um, and a Cartesian join is basically a join where you're combining every row of one table with every row of another table. Um, and it's just very annoying um, and extremely resource intensive to actually do so. Um, so make sure you're just only using that if you really, really, really need that for your particular use case. Now, the next thing you want to consider when writing Spark locally is making sure you're implementing checkpointing and fault tolerance. This is really critical for streaming jobs or iterative ML workloads where you need to revert back to previous versions of the data if there's any kind of corruption um, or your whole model could be at risk. And here, you're basically going to want to set up a, you know, regular backup essentially to a uh, S3 bucket, uh, high density file system, any kind of file system really, where you can quickly store those checkpoints and use the built-in persist and checkpoint methods for relational databases and use those multiple times workloads to make sure you're having consistent checkpoints after every operation. Um, and also monitor stages there to identify you know fragile nodes as uh, you know your processes run so that you know, hey, there's a large chance that this process might fail because the data is a little hunky. Um, and so I want to make sure I have a checkpoint before that process runs every time. Um, but don't over cache. Don't just save a lot of memory and cache. Make sure you're using external file storage. Um, otherwise, you're going to overwhelm your memory and potentially start crashing your own compute nodes. So now the next thing you want to think about with, with running Spark locally is using the right file format. Um, you're going to want to make sure you're managing your metadata and file formats efficiently um, using Parquet or ORC instead of CSV and JSON for I.O. intensive workloads. Um, and avoid writing too many small files, especially on S3. Try to bulk them into larger files um, for those kind of backups, especially too. And then also make sure you're running regular cleanup operations of any unused tables or external table metadata if you, you know, no longer are processing a table uh, to make sure that you know, you're not just needlessly bulking up and you know, kind of just hoarding data that you don't actually need. Um, and then also use compaction jobs to merge small files regularly um, so that, you know, you, hey, this old legacy data that you maybe don't need to have segments anymore, compact that into one larger file over time so that you don't have a ton of large, smaller files. You just have, you know, let's say the, the last six weeks smaller files before they all get compacted. Now, the next thing that you probably don't want to do, but you will need to do, um, is setting up Spark metrics and monitoring and integrating them into a monitoring stack. Um, Self-management requires observability. Um, if you're not using something like Databricks, you're going to want to use and you know integrate with something like a Prometheus or Grafana to visualize all your Spark metrics and you know all your logs, so that you have a place to monitor and, and troubleshoot any kind of issues with Spark. Um, and also set up Spark event logs and pipe them out 
So you have job replay and debugging, perp, uh, debugging actions that you can take from there. So you can look through, hey, what are all the Spark event logs that happened before the crash? Um, and then also you can tune log4j to emit useful logs, the right verbosity. So, you know, hey, info logs, you know, maybe I want to actually read them prod, but only I will only want to emit the debug logs for my dev instance. Um, you know, make sure you're basically tuning 4J, log4j to send you the logs that are most relevant to you instead of just all of them because they know it's going to alert fatigue. Um, and then Spark History Server is also a great tool for visibility and job performance over time. So it's really great for, you know, as we talked about earlier, monitoring your performance, your jobs, and adjusting the compute to align with, you know, hey, what can help my jobs run most efficiently? Yes, that's right. I had that kind of relation. Now, the next thing you want to think about is your Spark cluster security. Um, security is often ignored in DIY setups. Don't make that mistake. Uh, use SSL for REST APIs and web UIs. You know, this is just one example of a secure client server tunnel. Um, also, things like Kerberos, OAuth, LDAP authentication are all very common ways to secure a Spark cluster as well. Um, and if you're running in the cloud, using IAM roles, attaching an IAM role to your Spark cluster and using that to dictate access to external services, it's a really great way to easily uh, monitor, manage, and grant access to your Spark cluster to any services it needs to um, without you know, kind of having to bulk manage much bunch of credentials. Um, and generally, just best practices, avoid exposing the Spark UI and master port publicly without applying some kind of firewall or authentication system in between that and anyone that wants to access it. Now, the last tip I have for you is integrating unit testing and CICD and automating all of that. Um, operational excellence starts with repeatability. Running good Spark jobs make sure means you have repeatable Spark jobs. Um, so you're going to want to do things like use unit tests for transformations and data validation, um, which you have an example of here. You know, data testing, unit testing your data frame transformations. Also, write integration tests for full data flows using test data sets. Um, and also make sure you're using CICD to deploy Spark jobs from version controlled code providers so you're not just directly writing code into Spark and you have the ability to revert back to previous versions of your code. Um, and then think about automating kind of the uh, running of these pipelines with something like Airflow uh, you know, or any other pipeline orchestration tool, really any other workflow orchestration tool. So those are all the Spark tips and best practices I have for you. Hope you enjoyed this video, especially the person who requested it. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Dave Guy out.